And what Lotus are saying is that the supercharger has to be replaced, which is absolutely crazy. Obviously, nobody's owning up to wanting to pay that 10 grand. <laughs> Today's video is presented in partnership with Hampson Auctions, one of the UK's leading classic, performance and supercar auction houses. Their next sale takes place on the 24th of November at the magnificent Bowlesworth Castle in Cheshire. Hi everybody, welcome back to Rich Reviews and today we're going to give you an update on the issues with our Lotus Amira and I'm going to talk you through this in two parts. The first part is going to be talking you through the updates on the current issues that we've already talked about with regards to the car, the issues that we bought the car with. And the second part is going to be talking through new issues that we've noted with the car. And you want to stay on for that towards the end because there's quite a few additional issues. Now, we're just driving now on some of our country roads that we like to drive on. We're just, you know, out for a drive with the car really, having a good time, enjoying the Amira and we came across an Electra. Now, we've never seen an Electra out in the wild before, so that was very interesting to see one of those, and they did flash us as well. Um, it was in Heffel Yellow, so I think it's Heffel Yellow for the Electras. I think that's one of the options for those cars, but that's obviously the 4x4 that Lotus have released. And also then subsequently or shortly after, we saw a Jag D-Type, would you believe it? And the, the owner there as well waved to us, so, Obviously those are fantastic cars, but the Electra not so great because of the range, but we won't get into that. But the D-Type obviously is a, is a classic car worth a small fortune. And even those people are waving to us in our Lotus Amira. So everybody loves the Lotus Amira. We get great attention, always positive. People love this car. So we're gonna stop. We're gonna find a nice scenic place to stop and I'm gonna talk you through updates on the existing three major issues and then we're going to go for a drive again and then i'll talk you through the new issues that we found on the car so we've just pulled over at this quite obscure location we've got this beautiful autumn day which really showcases the beautiful paintwork on our lotus amira this heffel yellow paintwork as you can see why we chose this particular specification of this car it really stands out on film and it really pops in this sunlight looks absolutely stunning it really really showcases how the lotus amira is a mini supercar and that's why it's classed that's why it's called the mini supercar because just look at it, it looks fantastic in this autumn sunlight so we've pulled over to talk you through the updates on the three major issues we have and we've already advertised with our car the three major issues that we purchased the car with so the first issue is the windscreen the windscreen is split now the windscreen is made up of two pieces of glass sandwiched together again i talked in more in detail in our previous video so catch those for more detail the inner pane of glass is split and it's a common issue with these cars it splits down to where the rear view mirror is located which is here now this has actually got a lot worse it started to split right across we'll show you some additional footage when we can get out of the reflections because you can't really see it here but it's starting to go right across the side of the car so the windscreen is going to have to be replaced pretty quickly otherwise we're going to have a major issue there the second problem i can't really show you but it's to do with the air conditioning climate control system whereby the resistor has been impacted by water ingress and it's actually broken so it's i you know i don't know what the actual water ingress has done whether it's short circuited it but it's not it sort of seems that that may be the issue but in effect the climate control air conditioning is either full on or full off full off so you have to turn it down and it just switches totally off you've got no intermediary so you You've got no variable control on the climate control and that's because when lotus were designing the car underneath this section which you can only lift up with some special tools to actually unlatch and unbolt some some fasteners down the side here underneath here you've got certain access to certain areas like the brake fluid etc so certain serviceable items and also under there you've got a wiring loom access for the climate control system and what happens is water is ingressing through here and through the top somehow not quite sure how i think it must be through the top here and it's following the wiring loom channel down to the climate control system and it's rusted away or caused an impact with the resistor now that's obviously a design flaw so what lotus have done is they've 
redesigned it. They've redesigned it by um, making by designing a membrane that goes underneath this part of the car. Now I'm not too sure what that membrane looks like. When it's fitted, I'll show you what it looks like and I'll, we'll try and get some footage when the car is actually having the work performed so that you can see the, the actual membrane that they're fitting. But that membrane will seal out that area of the car and will, will prevent water ingress, so it will prevent it happening again. And also, of course, they're changing the resistor and to do that, they have to slide the dash forwards a certain amount. They don't have to remove the dash fully, they manage to slide the dash forwards a certain amount and then they can gain access to the resistor to replace it. Now the third major item of course is the engine cover, the osmosis on the engine cover which is a reaction with the composite materials that they use to make these panels and the paintwork. As you can see here you've got the osmosis which is the bubbling effect that you get with the reaction with the composite materials and the paintwork. Now, most of these panels are manufactured by a company called Tajin Automotive Technologies, and they're based out of Portugal and France. And these panels are actually made mostly in France. That's where they're physically manufactured. And these panels that were outsourced for manufacture to Tajin Automotive Technologies because they obviously had all the skills to create these panels. Now, I don't know why they're having these problems with this reaction with osmosis. Commonly on other mirrors, it's impacting the doors, which is also provided by Tajin Automotive Technologies. But it's obviously a design flaw and they've rectified it. Um, and they've rectified it with later body panels, but it's affecting a lot of Emiras, as I say, mostly with the doors, but mine only with the engine lid. And the reason why Tajin Technologies was used to manufacture these panels, and the reason why they use that process, that particular process of these particular types of composite materials, is because the composite materials that Tajin use provide 43%, on average, 43% lighter panels. Now, that is a major, major criteria for developing a sports car or a supercar or a hypercar, of course. Major, major criteria to develop the car as light as possible. And obviously, the panels are a substantial part of that car. So these panels, perceivably, are around 43% lighter than normal composite material panels because of the manufacturer process that they use. So you can understand why they wanted to use that company. And of course, another part of the reason why they use Tajin Automotive is because they could manufacture these panels, or not a lot of the reason why they use that process that Tajin are using, in effect, the approach that they use to fashion these panels these, out of this composite material, is because they managed to create this beautiful, sleek design out of these composite materials. And it's just beautiful in how they've designed this, especially, especially the sculpted sections of the doors. As you look down the side of the door, the way the door is sculpted on this, in this concave channel to be able to provide the access directly in to this air intake, which provides obviously air intake into the engine to help with air cooling for the engine and obviously to help with feeding air into the engine for the combustion process. And of course, to provide cooling into the rear wheel air. And also it helps reduce pressure or, de or depression rather on top of the wheel arches, which um, reduces lift on that section as well. So it's all part of the aerodynamics too. So, in effect, unless you had that sort of design technology to be able to make these panels in that way, you wouldn't have a car that looked like this. So it's a major part of the design process. But it means that the engine cover has got to be replaced. Now, rather than respray it, what Lotus are doing is they are actually replacing the whole engine cover, which is pretty cool and that engine cover will be sprayed at Lotus. It, it comes in from Tajin with a coating, with a base layer coating on there already, which I believe is an electrostatic coating, so it's electrically charged to be able to apply it. And then, and then Lotus apply the actual top coat. So the top coat will be applied by Lotus, so it will be go through. In effect, the engine cover will go through their normal manufacture process for creating the engine cover, which is great because that's a lot better than this engine cover being stripped back and then them having another go at spraying it and possibly getting it wrong again because who knows why there's a reaction, who knows why that, that osmosis has occurred. It may be that there's a flawed process with that particular engine cover that you know you can't get that engine cover right who knows i don't know but this is the process that lotus are doing so thumbs up to lotus from that respect and i believe they're doing the same with the doors as well for the other for the other lotus owners who've got the osmosis on the doors they're replacing the panels in their entirety so that's pretty impressive i can't see that that's very cost effective but <laughs> that's what they're doing so i'm happy with that so the whole engine cover the whole thing apparently is being replaced so Pretty cool. 
So that's the update on those three main issues that we have with the car. Now there's quite a few additional items that I'm going to talk you through as well, but we're going to get back in the car and I'm going to talk you through those items as we're driving because we want to get more driving in this beautiful autumn day and so that we can show you some of the driving with the car as well because it's not all doom and gloom, you know, this is just issues with this car, it's a new design car and it's just how it is. If you were looking to purchase your first supercar or add a car to your collection, Rich Reviews has already helped multiple owners secure their dream supercar. We have a mix and match of services to help take the pain away to ensure a happy, memorable purchase away from the stress that can be caused by car research and dealing negotiations. Our mix and match of services include telephone support calls, pre-purchase inspection and car collection video. For more information, please contact me via a message in the comments below or at the following email address. Now back to the video. Number one, the first additional item is the SOS system. The SOS system communicates with the emergency services and you can actually instigate a call to the SOS services as well by pressing a button on this top section here. I don't want to focus on where it is because I'm driving so I don't want to detract from driving. But there's a button up here which enables you to actually make a request to the SOS services manually if you want to, so in effect it calls them. Now the SOS system has a SIM integrated into it to call the services, so it must use the tele telecommunications network, the GSM network. If it cannot see that GSM network for some reason, say for example if you're in a restricted area, if you're in a bad reception area, like for example if the car's locked away in a garage that's going to be common practice or if the backup battery is low on voltage and needs charging then you get an SOS warning and what the SOS warning comes up on the dash says is for you to take your car to the dealership to sort out the SOS issue in effect to, to get the SOS system serviced. Now this obviously is an error that isn't really representative to the actual problem because the problem is that one of two issues. Number one, either the car cannot see the GSM network and or the five volt backup battery needs charging. Now the five volt backup battery isn't charged from the battery tender unit. So if you've got the car on charge, it won't charge up that backup battery. The backup battery is only charged when you're driving the Lotus. So it must take a feed directly from the alternator. Why they've designed it like that, I don't know, but it has been designed that way. So if it's low on charge or if it needs backing up, it's gonna show that warning. Or if the SOS system cannot see the GSM network, and cannot communicate with the network, then it throws up that same warning. This is resolved with a firmware update, and it doesn't actually resolve those issues because you can't resolve it. That would need a complete redesign, and perceivably isn't designed badly. It's just the error that's wrong. So the firmware update provides an update to the type of error that you'll receive. So what the firmware update will change is, in effect, the warning that comes up will say something along the lines of reduced SOS functionality. And then when you're outside or when the, when the battery's charged up or when the system sees the network, then that error will go away and you'll no longer get the notification on the dash. And by the way, if the issues are resolved, the error isn't cleared on the dash until you physically actually stop and then, and then restart the car later on. Um, we had that error today because the car's been in the garage um, and it couldn't see the GSM network. So um, when we came out and, and uh, drove the car and then stopped and then restarted the car again, it then was resolved. I'm just going to have to turn the climate control on now to clear the, the windscreen and it goes unfortunately on full blast because that's one of the major issues we have with the car because the, the windscreen does mist up quite easily on these cars. If I crack the window a little bit actually that should help a little bit but we've got to try and avoid noise obviously when we're filming. So let me just put it on windscreen to focus that. And that's, yeah, full blast. <laughs> but it does clean the windscreen pretty quickly. And it's decided to turn off. So yeah, pretty cool. Just when we needed it, but there you go. Um, and now it's decided to come back on again. So yeah, yeah, the nuances of the climate control of a Lotus when you've got the resistor failing. <clears throat> now the second issue we have is with regards to the driver's door. There's wind noise at motorway speed on the driver's door. Now you notice it more 
I'm just going to turn the climate control down. Now you notice it more because the car is actually quite silent. So they've done a great job in general with these panels. It doesn't make much noise. Um, because the rest of the car doesn't make much noise, it's really noticeable when you get a certain area of the car that does make quite a bit of noise. And this door at motorway speeds does make quite a bit of noise. The way they're going to resolve that, again, this is something that is already on the Lotus list. So Lotus do, the Lotus dealership do know about this and are going to look into this when the car comes in for those three, up and three major items to be repaired they will realign the door. Apparently that's done by the door being hooked up to an electronic laser alignment system. And perceivably from what I've been told, the hooking up of the door to the, to the system, to the electronic system to check its alignment and to see how much it is out of alignment takes a lot longer than actually making the adjustments that the system tells you need to be made. Apparently the, the actual adjusting of the door takes a few minutes, but it's setting all up, put it in the electronic system and checking how much out of alignment it is, is um, the thing that takes all the time. So perceivably that will be resolved and it's sort of a known about problem. Uh, and again, just a little foible. So that will be resolved going forward. The next item that I've noted, and again, this has been pointed out to Lotus already, is these controls on the climate control. They are very stiff in certain areas. They are, they're a right pain in the backside sometimes to operate. Both the left-hand side, I mean, it's coming on full blast now. Um, so apologies for that. I'm just gonna have to turn it up a little bit. And also, and also the right-hand side as well, but more so the heater control, more so the temperature control. It's not so much the fan control. Now, the next item, which is very pertinent now because it's shown up here, is the parking sensor. The parking assist sensor on the front seems to always come on when we stop the car, wherever we're in a location to anything. Um, it's, it's a right pain in the backside, and that could be a failing parking assist sensor. You see it's come on now. You see it's come on now, and we're just stopped here. There's nothing in front of us, so there's no blockade. You know, there's no reason why that should come on. And the next item on the list, which is something that has already been mentioned to the Lotus dealership, is the hill hold or the electronic parking brake disengaging. So when we stop, the, the electronic parking brake automatically engages. Um, so um, on hill hold, or if you put the, the electronic parking brake on, it should automatically disengage itself. But sometimes, very, very rarely, it doesn't and it just really holds the car. You can't pull away, so the car stalls. But as soon as you restart the car, it's all right. It then disengages. I've spoken to the dealership about this and they've told me that they know about these sort of issues and it's just a fine tuning of the EPG system, electronic parking brake system, or the hill hold system. I think they're integrated. But to be able to gain access, to be able to tune it and reconfigure it, they, it needs a firmware update or it needs one of the later firmwares that provides access to the configuration area for them to be able to configure and alter the electronic parking brake settings. So it will have to take one of the later firmwares. And incidentally, the latest firmware that this, this car will have to take during those fixes updates has a bug in it itself. <laughs> And I've been told about this bug and it's, I've just got to take the software, I've got to take the firmware and I've got to accept the bug. And the bug is that sometimes you go to start the car and it just won't start. It just will not start, whatever you do. So what you have to do to get it out of that process to make it so you can start is you have to lock the car, unlock the car, open the door, close the door and then you can start the car. I have actually had that a couple of times with this firmware, so I think it's a bug that's already in the car anyway, but it's only happened to me once before. But that apparently is a byproduct of the latest firmware, and they haven't got a fix for that yet. But I have to take that latest firmware so that they can have access to configure the EPG issue. So it is what it is, as they say. Now, the final issue is with regards to the supercharger and its relation to a broken bolt or thread with regards to the adjustment of the wastegate actuator valve for the supercharger. And to be able to walk you through the issues on that, really, I need to show you. So we're gonna pull over again, and I'm gonna just talk you through briefly what the issues are with that, and what the process is, or where we are now with regards to that being resolved. So the wastegate actuator valve is 
this part. So it's the bit that Lotus have always, always said in their publications, in their marketing, is nice to see because obviously it's actuating as you're driving the car. So it looks quite cool. You can see it in the rear view mirror. And there's a threaded bolt or a thread really, it's not actually a bolt, that is down here. And what it does is it sets the start position of the actuator. So this is a wastegate actuator valve and it sets the start position of the actuator valve. And this bolt, as you can see, or thread rather, no longer exists. It's been sheared off. And if you look down there, it looks like there's a little bit of rust in there. So I don't know how it's got rusty, but that should be there. And that wasn't there when we collected the car. Now, there's all sorts of complicated intricacies with this. Um, and we've known about this for quite a while. And I'm just reporting what the issue is. I'm not reporting about a tributation of blame or anything like that because it will be resolved in some way, shape or form. But there's a nuance involved to it and that's the bit that I'm going to bring to camera. When we collected the car, we noticed, obviously we're creating footage, so we did loads of footage of the engine cover when we collected the car and we noticed when we looked at the footage that Fred wasn't there. Now, it's only because I know that there's an adjustment there because I'm an engineer that, that I knew the Fred was missing. And it was there when we test drove the car. In between that time, the car went for its first service, which was organized by Safwat Cars, who we bought the car from. Perceivably, the technician there, maybe <laughs> not wanting to attribute blame, uh, happened to break off that thread. But that technician apparently no longer works for that dealership anymore. So yeah bit bizarre that but the approaches to try and resolve this are that Rybrook Bristol have said okay we'll we'll order the part and if it's quite cheap we'll just pay for it and we'll sort it out which is very good of them it's quite it could be perceivably quite a cheap part and I say Rybrook have been very very helpful they've said we'll order the parts they've ordered the parts in what they thought was the right parts because it was very hard to tell they did their best the parts that came in were wrong now they queried this with Lotus and Lotus said, you can't get those parts separately. Now this wastegate actuator valve bolts on to the supercharger. The supercharger is made by a company called Engelbrook. And this is just a bolt on part, but apparently you can't get this separate, which is ludicrous. And what Lotus are saying is that the supercharger has to be replaced which is absolutely crazy this supercharger which is this whole top system this whole top this whole top assembly this is around seven thousand nearly eight thousand pounds pre-vac so to have a new supercharger fitted the quotation comes to over ten thousand pounds just because a thread has snapped off which can be drilled out or probably if you look underneath there there's a bit of thread remaining you could probably get a pair of mole grips on that and unscrew the thread and remove it as an engineer i know that i could unbolt this wastegate actuator myself i could put it into a vise carefully obviously making sure you don't damage it i could drill that bugger out worst case scenario i could re-tap it i could have that done in around an hour but lotus are saying <laughs> You cannot get that part and it has to be have the whole supercharger replaced at a cost of £10,000. Obviously, nobody's owning up to wanting to pay that 10 grand. <laughs> Go figure. But that's the craziness that revolves around Lotus. I mean, that this is going to be resolved without 10 grand being outlaid. It has to be because that is just absolutely bleeding ludicrous. Like I say, if the car wasn't under warranty and if it was me and I had to expend that cash to get it repaired, I would unbolt that actuator and I would have drilled out that thread and I would have got another bolt, another thread, and I would have reached, reset it up myself. It's ludicrous. But again, that is the nuance of Lotus. So I thought you'd enjoy that. And there's no attribution of blame. It just is what it is. It, it was noticed, as I said, when we collected the car, the thread was broken and that thread was there when we test drove the car. And the only thing that happened in between that was it went for its first service. There you go. But at least we have explicit evidence. So we're covered from whatever angle. But, uh, but yeah, 10 grand for your supercharger. No way is that happening. No way.